Hello, very good to see you. So thank you, thank you very much for being here today to tell us about your paper. And today we are going to do it a bit differently because also we have our first author. Stefan is also here. Hi, Stefan. Hi. So both welcome. So we can uh, we can start with uh, your presentation, Mike, and then in the questions. Um, probably Stefan will also contribute a lot to us. So if you start sharing your screen and maybe introduce yourself before you go to your talk. Great, yeah, thanks Ernest for the opportunity to uh, present our, our paper today at your uh, journal club. Um, so yeah, so this is, uh, so we're very excited. This paper just came out uh, online in science this past week. And uh, we're gonna talk about uh, how uh, cytotoxic T cells and natural killer cells uh, in your immune system uh, kill other cells like virally infected cells or cancer cells. So this is a hot topic in areas like cancer immunotherapy. And of course, now we can't underestimate the importance of killing viruses. Uh, so, and there's the title and the uh, authors and very pleased to have Stefan the lead author uh, here on the call. Uh, so, so I just want to first introduce immunological synapses. So uh, this you know, is a concept that goes back to the 1980s, uh, but was really kind of, uh, you know, really kind of visualized most strikingly uh, by Avi Kupfer in the mid 1990s uh, with this concept of uh, supramolecular uh, activation clusters. And what they were able to show is that in a interaction between a helper T cell and an antigen presenting cell, you have, uh, this highly organized junction with a ring of adhesion molecules. Uh, this, in this case, an integrin LFA1. And this is actually visualizing talin, which is a, uh, a cytoskeletal protein that's also well known in a focal adhesion. So, so immediately you have the connection between different types of systems using uh, similar machinery. Uh, and then the central cluster of uh, T cell receptor and the co-receptor CD28 or, or uh, co-stimulatory molecule CD28 with one of its uh, uh, signaling molecules, uh, protein kinase C theta. So, uh, so this kind of bullseye pattern uh, identified, you know, kind of evoked both ideas about, you know, effector function and uh, signaling. And, you know, in parallel, our work uh, utilizing supported lipid bilayers uh, gave us an ability not just to uh, in a very kind of uh, remarkably simple way, recapitulate what uh, Kupfer had seen in these uh, complex, much more complex cell-cell conjugates, but also to look more at the dynamics of this. So in the system, what we do is we use a supported lipid bilayer. This is a technology introduced by uh, Hardin McConnell, again in the 80s, was used in the initial demonstrations, such as demonstrations that MHC peptide complexes would uh, be the stimulatory ligands for T cells. In many cases, we'll use uh, polyclonal stimuli like these anti uh, T cell receptor anti CD3 antibodies, along with this adhesion ligand ICAM1, which is the ligand for LFA1. And just these two molecules in a laterally mobile form, and they can be fluorescently tagged, in the supported bilayer will stimulate the T cells to essentially think they're interacting with a antigen setting cell, like a B cell, for example, or a target cell, and essentially engage in formation of immunological synapse, which has a very similar overall structure to what Kupfer observed. And then of course, we could look at the dynamics of this using technologies like uh, turf microscopy that then came online around 2000 as a you know, very easy to access kind of commercial technology with uh, uh, high numerical aperture lenses. And this is just an example of kind of some signaling activity, a uh, kinase being recruited to the T cell receptor microclusters that uh, kind of move towards the center of the synapse. And the, the thing that I'm gonna be talking to you about today are these, uh, uh, kind of cytotoxic machinery, which is operating in the central part of the uh, synapse. So this is, uh, you know, kind of, I guess, one of my favorite electron micrographs from the 1980s that captured a, uh, the synaptic cleft between a uh, natural killer cell, so the innate counterpart of a T cell, and, a, uh, and its target. And even before uh, Kupfer's work, they really beautifully captured this adhesion, this annular adhesion structure, the LFA1 dependent uh, kind of adhesion ring, and this idea that there would be this kind of central uh, secretory domain. And this is the T, this is the NK cell, this is the target cell. These are the centrioles, so the cell kind of really polarizes. 
and as uh, Julian Griffiths has noted, the one of the centrioles kind of docks to the uh, plasma membrane at the synapse. Uh, and then, you know, all hell breaks loose. Basically, there's a lot of stuff that gets secreted into this uh, synaptic cleft. And the, the real, the, the machinery, the molecular machinery that kills the target cell is based on a poor forming protein perforin and uh, a whole set of uh, uh, enzymes uh, called granzymes. And I, I'm gonna talk a lot about one today called granzyme B, which we really kind of is maybe one of the two most abundant that we use as kind of a marker for the compartment. They're uh, very abundant, highly produced protein in these uh, cytotoxic T cells. And basically this protein goes through a pore that's formed in the plasma membrane or endosomal membranes of the uh, target cell. Uh, the pores may also contribute to lysis of uh, endosomes. And these, all these mechanisms all contribute to the introduction of uh, these granzymes into the cytoplasm, which then induce uh, caspase uh, cascades that lead to apoptosis. And actually there are multiple mechanisms that these different uh, enzymes can use. So, so again, it's a powerful system because it actually has quite a bit of uh, you know, apparent redundancy, but maybe because there are multiple ways to kill the target, this helps avoid uh, evasion by uh, mutations in tumors or, or evasion mechanisms in viruses. So these components, the precursors of the pore and the uh, granzymes are stored in what are referred to as uh, dense core granules. So if you think about like another reason, another name for a natural killer cell, these activated natural killer cells are large granular lymphocytes. They have these uh, maybe uh, half micron to one micron uh, compartments, vesicular compartments in their cytoplasm that contain these dense, incredibly concentrated uh, kind of condensates of uh, a uh, granzyme with a proteoglycan called sirglycin, and they also, the perform would also be contained in this complex. And when these uh, structures fuse to the plasma membrane, the textbook version of, uh, and they can be, and of course, just for the movie I'm gonna show you in a second, uh, the granzyme B is labeled with RFP, and a membrane protein in the uh, granule uh, membrane, the limiting membrane of the granule, is labeled green. So this is gonna be that channel, this is the green channel, this is the red channel. And what you're gonna see is the textbook version of what happens when these granules fuse. And that is that the, uh, the enzyme, the fluorescent labeled enzyme basically disperses. And it's like, it, it almost looks like kind of a bomb going off there. But what you'll notice is there's also this particle over here that actually becomes bright. So it gets into the turf field. Uh, but it's essentially, uh, it never disperses in the time frame of the movie. So, uh, and this is one, this is the kind of thing that we're interested in in this study, essentially is understanding if there are cytotoxic particles and, uh, if, and if there are cytotoxic particles, I guess, what are they like? And maybe start to understand what they would be used for. So this is another area that goes back a number of years. So if you, uh, when, when I was uh, finishing up my graduate work, uh, a paper came out uh, from Peter Peters group in, in the European Journal of Immunology that kind of put forward and then a, and then a subsequently a, a, a Immunology Today uh, review that kind of put forward a very, uh, you know, quite uh, imaginative striking kind of model that you'd have these, the dense cores would basically uh, actually be uh, contained within a membrane uh, that could itself have T cell receptors associated with it. And then this structure, this, uh, the lytic agents inside this membrane bound compartment would engage the target independently of the T cell and actually uh, after release from the T cell, of course, and then could add another layer of specificity to this killing reaction. So uh, again, and this was based on some uh, electron microscopy studies with Han Hoise, a fantastic cell biologist. So, so there's no doubt that these kinds of phenomena were observed. You have the dense core, you have uh, exosomes probably are, are you know, uh, intraluminal vesicles within the, these endolysosomal compartments that would contain T cell receptor, which are turning over rapidly in activated lymphocytes. So these things would naturally come together and they came up with this, you know, very interesting imaginative model. There are other studies, uh, 2000, maybe every 10 years, this kind of came back. In 2002, studies on the circlysin granzyme B complex showing that when this complex is formed, it generates intrinsically 100 nanometer uh, particles because the sirglycin is such a large extended proteoglycan that it binds around 40 granzyme Bs. It forms this large complex, but those complexes are very unstable. And if you dilute the granzyme B, they, they fly apart very quickly like those movies I showed you just a second ago. 
On the other hand, you have cytotoxic uh, exosomes that have come in since around 2012. And the concept that these cells are releasing uh, cytotoxic proteins, uh, the membrane protein FAST, for example, and perforin and granzyme in, in exosomes, again, again, coming back to this kind of idea. But again, uh, this is kind of simmered along with a pretty murky understanding of what's going on from a cell biological standpoint. So, so this is the kind of context that we were starting to work in. So in order to uh, probe or, or get an initial idea whether cytotoxic T cells transfer complexes containing granzyme B, we designed an experiment in collaboration with Sabina Mueller and Salvatore Valatuti, who's uh, also, I think, on the, uh, will be, I think is gonna follow it on YouTube. Uh, so he basically, uh, they had a, a granzyme B fusion with M cherry and uh, uh, this, uh, 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 SE fluorin molecule, which is a pH sensitive uh, fluorescent protein. In this experiment, we only use the M cherry feature. So we have essentially a, a red granzyme B, which in the experiment is color coded green, pseudo colored green. So then we uh, borrowed a, uh, an ex a kind of a, uh, a phenomenon that uh, Pietro de Camilli's lab observed in uh, neural synapses that you can basically label the cores of a uh, uh, synaptic vesicles using wheat germagglutinin because the wheat germagglutinin, when you treat cells with it, and that's kind of in magenta here, so it labels the membrane, but then if you wash out the wheat germagglutinin and chase the cells, basically incubate them at 37 degrees for a while, these, uh, the wheat germagglutinin ends up getting concentrated in the core of these granules, which are very rich in the glycoproteins that contain the ligand for wheat germagglutinin. So the experiment was basically to look at whether this entire complex that coming, coming from these uh, dense core granules would be transferred efficiently into the target cell and essentially how many events would we see that basically had co-labeling for these two structures. And again, I'm, I'm, I'm not really drawing it very carefully here. I recognize this would probably be you know, the, the form in which this is in the cytoplasm or inside the target cell could be in a vesicle, could be in a vesicle that's broken. So we don't accept, we haven't really paid too close attention to that, but basically just scoring essentially these uh, uh, events where we have a strong signal for both in the uh, cytoplasm of the uh, target cell. And the other important thing is that wheat germagglutinin doesn't interact with granzyme B. So if these things are co-transferred, it would probably, it would mean that other proteins must be involved to pull them together. And that would be, again, evidence for particles. So here's the movie that uh, Sabina generated, uh, confocal microscope in, in Toulouse. And uh, you have the magenta, which is the wheat germagglutinin, and the green, which is the uh, granzyme B. I'm not going to ask you to follow anything because basically this experiment ran as a movie, but then required very careful analysis. But you can see basically the material is moving around. And in fact, in the actual experiment, the uh, target cells are also labeled with a CMAC dye, a blue dye, so that we could distinguish them from the cytotoxic T cells very definitively. So, uh, let's see if I. Oh. So Stefan then quantified these events and found that, and all, oh, the other thing that's important is that these T cells that were being used by Sabina are antigen specific, virus specific cytotoxic T cells. They see a cytomegalovirus uh, peptide, this PP65 peptide, and we can basically expose the tumor cells to this or not. If you expose the tumor cells, you get many of these particles where you have both signals in the cytoplasm. It's on the order of 20 per cell. Whereas if you don't pulse them, you don't see these. So this observation gave us the confidence to <clears throat> believe at this point that there were these particles that were being uh, transferred with granzyme B and other proteins and complexes. And that we started to think of these as supramolecular attack particles or SMAPs. So I'll, I'll refer to these as SMAPs subsequently. So one question that came up about these, especially from those movies say where we had to wait up to an hour for these things to accumulate to a level where we could count them is, is this like kind of a slow mechanism related to how these particles may be a slow mechanism relative to the rapid release I showed you a moment ago where the particles just kind of uh, essentially, or the uh, granzyme B just essentially disperses when it goes into the extracellular space, presumably just the dense cores dispersing. Uh, so in order to do this, we basically, uh, Stefan did some experiments with the construct that we obtained from uh, from the Valatuti lab. And now essentially we're going to use both of these uh, fluorescent proteins. We'll use the M cherry to basically track total granzyme B and the, uh, the fluorine construct to track the, uh, uh, the emergence of the uh, GFP into the extracellular space. Because this, 
the fluorescence of this uh, uh, GFP is quenched in a low pH environment in the granules, but it becomes fluorescent when, when it's released. So now if you look at the movie, it's gonna go way too fast. And you see it's already happened. Basically within 12 minutes, we already have uh, a strong signal here. Let's see if I can rein this in. Okay, yeah, there we go. So between zero and one minutes, basically as fast as basically Stefan was imaging and he was somewhat limited by photo bleaching as to how fast he could image, basically he has these uh, green structures emerging from this cloud of uh, total granzyme B. So, so again, the cells reserve much of their granzyme B in these stores, but then within uh, a minute and then a few minutes later, you have multiple particles, which are granzyme B positive. And again, they're, some of them are probably dispersing and we can't, that's happening faster than we're imaging, but some of them are basically staying. And, and at this point I could just point out and the data's in the paper that about 50% of the granzyme B is released in a soluble form and 50% in these uh, structures that we're calling SMAPs. So again, SMAP release is fast. So the next question we want to ask is can SMAPs kill? Can they kill uh, other cells? And can they do it autonomously? Can they do it on their own without the cytotoxic T cell around? So in order to do this, uh, Stefan essentially uh, set up the bilayer, allowed the cytotoxic T cells to release their SMAPs for 90 minutes at 37 degrees. So he basically allowed uh, pretty much the, the reaction to go to completion, uh, the cells to release as much as they could. And then he uh, knocked the cells off with cold PBS and just kind of tangential flow in a flow cell. And this flow, tangential flow, affects the cell much more than it affects these small particles. So the particles remain, they at least, well, that was a question actually, whether the particles remain. So the result is here. So basically the, in this case, we're staining perforin and granzyme with antibodies. And we can see the perforin and granzyme in the center here. So the green, magenta, and mostly white signals. Now, if you knock the cell off, the SMAPs, these, the, uh, these signals remain. And in fact, we see some ICAM-1 accumulated. So it appears that the SMAPs remain adherent to these substrates, perhaps in part through an interaction with ICAM-1, which is one of the two specific molecular species along with the anti-CD3 in the substrate. And you can see in the interference reflection microscopy, which shows close contact, that these SMAPs are closely in contact with the supported lipid bilayer. So we're using the supported lipid bilayer in this case to capture these particles. And now we can come in with a viable target cell, happy live cell uh, and see if we can kill it. And when, you, when we kill it, it'll release uh, LDH, uh, which is a uh, cytoplasmic enzyme and that's easily assayed in the extracellular space. And we use this as a way to, people used to use uh, the radioactive isotope chromium, but no one uses radioactive isotopes anymore. So, so this is much, much better. Uh, so the, and the result of this experiment is shown here that basically when we elicit the formation of SMAPs with increasing concentrations of anti-CD3, they become increasingly cytotoxic. And this is a phenomenon that we don't really understand the basis of at this point. But again, it's, it's quite interesting that the arming of the particles or their activity seems to be related not just to a, any trigger to release them, but, but the strength of that trigger. Uh, so, so again, and, and some controls. So essentially the, uh, this is the spontaneous release level. And this is uh, essentially of, of LDH just by the cells without any uh, effort to kill them. And this is the, uh, uh, the, just showing that basically under these conditions, basically we don't see any LDH activity in the SMAPs themselves, which would obviously be a problem for the experiment. So we don't see that. So the next question, so, so SMAPs can kill autonomously without the help of the cytotoxic T cell that produced them. So the composition, uh, and of course, I, I should also point out that we didn't pulse these cells with peptides, so there's no implication of T cell receptor here, which is another important point uh, about again, eventually about our final picture of these particles. Uh, so SMAP composition. So in order to um, look at the composition, we did mass spectroscopy with Roman Fisher, who's uh, another co-author on the paper, who's on the, uh, on the call today and can answer questions if you have any questions about the proteomics. So Stefan basically took the particles which were left on the planar bilayer, eluded them off under harsh conditions to basically uh, capture them and, and, and initiate their denaturation so that they could be proteolytically digested and subjected to uh, liquid chromatography and, uh, and mass spec, uh, a very sensitive uh, instrument basically. And then 
uh, an analysis process that would identify uh, the source uh, proteins associated with uh, the material. And the, the specificity in this experiment came from doing the experiment with and without the anti-CD3 antibody. So either the T cells were subjected to the an ICAM-1 only substrate, the adhesion molecule only, or ICAM-1 plus the anti-CD3. And we collected particles, you know, essentially the SMAPs in the latter case, anything, whatever basically was left behind on the substrate in the former case, we wouldn't expect to see many of these particles, but that was the, that was basically the way we would distinguish specific things from basically things that were not that uh, irrelevant. And we identified around 280 proteins, around 150 of those were increased by uh, antigen recognition uh, by the anti-CD3 antibody. We see multiple uh, granzymes, for example, and I guess this diagonal line, this is the ICAM-1, this is the ICAM-1 plus anti-CD3. So things that are above this diagonal line are potentially induced by the anti-CD3, so they're antigen specific in these polyclonal T cell experiments. Uh, and you know, so we saw the granzymes we expected, we saw perforin. Uh, unexpectedly, we saw uh, the cytokine interferon gamma and particularly CCL5 is a very strong induced signal in the, uh, in, in the, in the, sub, in the T cells are reacted to the substrate. So it seemed like some cytokines were being released. And uh, again, we believe these could be part of the uh, SNAP. Uh, there's some, uh, uh, this kind of uh, 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 galactin-1, uh, kind of lectin, uh, extracellular lectin, and actual, well, you know, kind of a very interesting protein, but the things were, that really caught our attention were these uh, cytoskeletal, sorry, these uh, <laughs> extracellular matrix proteins, uh, thrombospondin-1 and thrombospondin-4. So, uh, so thrombospondin-1 particularly caught our attention because it's a, it's a very interactive protein. It has lots of uh, interactions with both matrix and other cells, and uh, you know, essentially uh, as a uh, major induced component in the, in the system and, and an unexpected one, we started following up thrombospondin one to try and understand what its contributions to the SNAPs were. So we obtained a uh, C-terminal uh, GFP fusion of uh, thrombospondin, so the full-length construct, and transfected uh, uh, human T cells with it, and basically subjected them to the procedure to basically make the SMAPs, put the SMAPs in the substrate. And what you can see here is basically with the transfection or without the transfection or mock transfection you have these, uh, the strong GFP signal associated with the particles that are adhered to the substrate. And this is one cell basically in this case, or this, the output from one cell. And then we used antibody sustained granzyme B and perforin. And what you can see again is that basically many of the particles are, are triple positive. So, so that you have basically these, uh, this kind of verifies uh, using a, a kind of a expression over expression approach that you have the, 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 this full length protein and the C terminus survive in this and, and make it into these uh, particles. Uh, we've also done, if you look at the supplemental material, we've done the other combinations where we use these fluorescently, like fluorescent protein tagged uh, granzyme B and then stain for perforin and, and, and uh, thrombospondin one with the same result. So, so with antibodies to the C terminus of thrombospondin one, we get a signal which we, we can then use to localize thrombospondin one to the particles that were released on the substrate. And interestingly, the, the part of, if you look at thrombospondin 1, people who know a little about thrombospondin 1, it's been studied for a long time. It's a major protein that's inducibly released from platelets uh, and has a lot of, uh, it's, it's known mostly for its role in uh, you know, regulating uh, angiogenesis. Uh, in, in, and it, of course, under non-reducing conditions, it's a large uh, 100, 140 kilowatt protein that trimerizes so this is, uh, and actually, so if you look at the structure here, this, this pro-collagen domain is a trimerization domain. So it forms a trimer. Uh, so that's kind of seen here, and it's a covalent trimer. Uh, and then if you run it under reduced conditions, you see the 140 kilowatt band for the uh, platelet thrombospondin one, but the cytotoxic T cells have a uh, 60 kilowatt uh, species. So, and, and this seems that this corresponds based on the antibody mapping to the C-terminus. So the part of the thrombospondin that we have would seem to be some, something basically is from, from here to here. Uh, and this, this, this mode, these type three repeats uh, bind about 20 calcium ions. So, so again, and this, this killing process is calcium dependent. So again, another kind of interesting connection, again, we don't fully understand the meaning of or the, the implications. So, so to determine, does thrombospondin contribute to T cell mediated killing? I mean, this was uh, you know, 
uh, unknown previously. So thrombospondin one has not been extensively studied in T cells and not in cytotoxic T cells. There's a component of this, this kind of machinery previously. So we use CRISPR to basically knock down two different, two different molecules that are identified in the SMAPs, the uh, LGAL S1 and the thrombospondin one. We were able to knock down the, uh, uh, the galactin, galactin one very efficiently, thrombospondin one less efficiently. So 60% uh, it's a knockout effectively, but basically we're not hitting all the loci. And perhaps this is a protein level measurement. So maybe there's an issue of the protein turnover. These proteins are stored in granules, so they may take a while to wash out once the cells are uh, the low size targeted. But at any rate, we had a significant knockdown and we saw a decrease in uh, cytolytic activity in the thrombospondin one compared to the control, but not the uh, Galactin-1. So galactin-1 is present in the particles, but not functionally relevant as far as we can tell, at least maybe it's redundant, perhaps contributes, but not in a unique way, uh, whereas thrombospondin-1 seems to contribute in a unique way. Of course, we would be looking forward at this point to doing more efficient uh, knockouts so that we could actually get rid of all the protein and see really more, more quantitatively what the extent of the defect is, but we were very happy that there was a you know, defect uh, related to this new protein we found. So in order to better understand the structure of these particles, uh, Stefan uh, basically uh, relied on his, uh, his, his earlier training in uh, using localization microscopy. And this is a method where you can basically take uh, diffraction limited uh, samples that you normally couldn't resolve due to the diffraction limit and basically use single molecule localization by making the fluorophores blink to construct much higher resolution uh, images. And this is kind of a, kind of a way to look at you know, you can kind of uh, write secret messages uh, if you write them small enough. Uh, but if you have a, a storm decoder, you can basically, uh, you know, very quickly figure out what's being uh, written here. It's basically our institute logo. So, uh, so again, this is just basically a, a simulated data to illustrate the point. Now we're getting to this 20 nanometer resolution, which is again, very useful for understanding the structure of particles like this. So again, now we went back to wheat germ agglutinin. So we knew that wheat germ agglutinin seemed to be binding a structure that was associated with these particles that was not granzyme B, but was essentially, uh, you know, presumably present in a very high concentration. And when uh, Stefan basically again took these uh, collections of uh, SMAPs that were basically released by the T cells, and then this is basically, these are the outputs from four different T cells on the substrate, and then use the storm imaging what you can start to appreciate if you zoom in on individual particles is this uh, appearance of a shell-like uh, structure in the 2D projection uh, of the data. And of course, this is we're not doing 3D storm at this point. We would love to, to do that in the future. But at this point, this, this projection would suggest a, a shell around the outside of the particle. And the particles are around 120 nanometers with the fluorescent dye and the, the, the size of the lectin itself and, uh, contributing to that. And, the, uh, and they're around, you know, again, 20 to 30 of these released per cell. Uh, so, so this was basically uh, the first kind of structural description we had is that the, the system, the, these particles don't seem to be homogeneous. Uh, and in fact, as I mentioned before, we thought they might be vesicles initially, but the fact that we could stain the granzyme B and perforin with antibodies suggested to us that there was uh, uh, you know, that again, the particles might be different, like maybe not uh, lipid based. And uh, in fact, these, these super resolution images, which uh, again, show wheat germ agglutinin and now also uh, thrombospondin one, emphasize this kind of core shell structure where you have, uh, you know, again, not highly ordered particles, but a, a kind of a gestalt that basically gives you a, a central distribution of uh, some condensed material, highly condensed uh, granzyme uh, and perforin with this uh, shell of glycoproteins, which include thrombospondin one. Uh, and again, you know, very, uh, you know, diverse detailed structures, but uh, again, a, an overall picture of this core shell uh, structure. And, if, and, and again, the, within this core shell structure, so even if there is a dense uh, shell of glycoproteins around the outside, we can access the core using antibodies, which are 150 kilodalton. So again, suggesting a, a dynamic or porous uh, structure, uh, again, which, which again would not be consistent with uh, this wheat germ agglutinin, for example, staining a lipid membrane, which would require permeabilization. So now in order to get a better physical feel for these particles, 
we uh, went to uh, Diamond Light Source, which is in South Oxfordshire, and uh, were introduced to Maria Harkiolaki by uh, Dave Stewart, who's a, a faculty member at, uh, at, at, at Oxford and one of the directors at Diamond. And I think he was talking to us at some point over time and realizing what we do and, and thinking, wow, you know, they should really talk to Maria. So, and he was right, because this was a, a great opportunity. So this is a, uh, so cryosoft X-ray tomography is a uh, imaging method where you essentially uh, freeze objects maybe up to 10 microns thick, uh, biological material, unstained, uh, vitrify them, rapid freezing and liquid ethane on a uh, EM grid, and then basically uh, use uh, uh, very refined uh, X-ray radiation, uh, soft X-rays off of the uh, beam line, uh, focusing them through your sample as you tilt the sample. And this is just basically kind of a, uh, the, some of the steps. So we, 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 we put the cells, we put ICAM-1 and anti-CD3 on the grids. We put the cells in the uh, put the, essentially the cells on that on that grid, which then act sort of like the planar bilayer in the earlier experiments, uh, incubate at 37 degrees for some period, maybe an hour or so to allow this uh, SMAP release process to go to completion. Either we remove the T cells or we don't, depending upon the individual sample, uh, maybe inspect the grid to check that something is there, uh, do the plunge freezing uh, rapidly, uh, not leaving the cell at room temperature for very long or uh, subject or you know to try and preserve particularly when there are live cells to try and preserve their their structure as best possible uh, and then uh, essentially performing the uh, imaging on this uh, beamline instrument and then uh, essentially doing uh, you know an analysis of the tilt series to reconstruct uh, the three-dimensional volumes and of course they can do uh, they have a sim system set up we haven't got to the point where we've extensively had the chance to do correlative imaging but in this case, we, we use the ability to control the conditions to basically be able to predict when these particles would show up and then use the appearance of the particles under the conditions of T cell stimulation to, uh, to get specificity in this case. And, and what we were able, what Stefan was able to see with, uh, with Maria on the, beam, on, this, on the system was that the uh, conditions where with the have anti-CD3 plus ICAM-1 and you're producing these particles, we now uh, see the expected clusters of uh, uh, small particles on the surface, which are only present when you have the anti-CD3 stimulation. And these have this uh, you know, clear uh, kind of dense, very dense uh, shell. And, and Maria was commenting, this doesn't look like a vesicle at all. Like a vesicle would not have this much uh, you know, evidence of material. And, and the material that basically is particularly being looked at here is carbon. So basically it's really looking at organic material in the sample which is interacting with these uh, uh, x-rays and essentially generating uh, contrast with no staining. So this is saying that, you know, we see this, this wheat germ agglutinin staining, it suggested this shell, thrombospondin one suggests this shell. Now we can materially see this shell using this uh, technology. So again, kind of, and now this, this is a, you know, a movie now of a cell and Stefan basically looked into the cells and then knowing what the SMAPs look like when they're outside the cell, looked for objects that look like SMAPs inside the cell. And he actually found a subset of granules uh, with dense uh, electron, you know, kind of, I uh, say X-ray dense material uh, that uh, essentially uh, have these low density uh, cores. And again, we need to do the correlations to, to, to better, you know, kind of uh, appreciate if, if we're right at this point. But at this point, we would uh, yeah, make a circumstantial case that these multi-core granules are the uh, storage place for preformed SMAPs that are released from the cytotoxic T cells in response to stimulation. So you'd have the conventional dense core granules that would, would kind of spray granzyme B and perforin at the target cell. But then you have these SMAPs that would have a secondary process where they would have this you know, shell that then uh, you know, we basically wanna continue to understand. This to advance. Oh. Yeah, so one last thing I want to talk about is I guess I know this is kind of a lipid interest group, almost done. Um, oh, so time is not, uh, I'm thinking longer than I, I hoped. Uh, so, so we also basically have this fast protein that is a cytotoxic protein from the CTLs. 
So you have basically, uh, uh, if we incorporate fast protein into the planar bilayer, shown here, so we're putting this extra protein in, it'll bind to fast ligand coming out of the uh, cytotoxic T cell. And basically then uh, we speculate would capture another type of particle, uh, which would be vesicles containing uh, this transmembrane protein fast ligand, which is cytotoxic. And, and basically what you can see essentially is that fast and fast ligand are recruited. You don't see the fast ligand if you don't have fast in the bilayer. So this would only be the release of these particles is only, or at least their capture on the substrate is only happening when you have a uh, fast in the substrate. So a fast positive artificial target. And, and then basically you have a kind of a distinct pattern of perforin and granzyme superimposed in the same compartment with this fast ligand. So we'd envision there are two types of particles. You have fast ligand in the uh, in a vesicle and the proteinaceous particles or SMAPs, which have uh, chorus or triglycin, uh, granzyme B, perforin, uh, other granzymes, chemokines, cytokines, and thrombospondin one in the shell. Uh, so just to sum up, so basically these particles are core shell nanoparticles of the shell of thrombospondin and antibody accessible core of cytotoxic proteins. The uh, SNAPs also contain chemokines and cytokines and have a broader role in, and may have a broader role in biology. That's something we're kind of interested in, like what are these molecules doing in the system? Uh, are they recruiting cells that then would be killed when they come in contact with these structures? That, that would be of interest. Uh, are they recruiting, you know, and, and, and essentially the, the interferon gamma could also contribute to that indirectly. Uh, so the C-terminus thrombospondin 1 binds CD47, which is a don't eat me signal. And, and this suggests that these particles could perhaps partner, partner with phagocytes. And if you think about the way viruses could avoid the system, uh, they could potentially downregulate the receptor for SNAPs. But if you downregulate CD47, you get eaten by a macrophage. So, so again, an interesting potential for kind of a missing self type recognition that would essentially keep cells honest and make sure that they always express these SMAP receptors. And we're of course very interested in, in SMAP engineering and the fact that we can make this GFP uh, uh, thrombospondin one with the C-terminal modification suggests that the, the thrombospondin can be engineered or modified and still makes it into the SMAPs. And these are uh, funders and other acknowledgements. Uh, again, we, we want to thank yeah, all our co-authors and uh, essentially uh, many members of the lab basically contributed materially to the project. Those uh, are acknowledged here. And uh, you know, essentially we have a number of other people who helped along the way and, uh, and our funders. So thanks and I'm sorry that time got away from me a little bit, but hope that's okay, Erdinch. Totally, totally. Thank you very much, Mike, for this fantastic talk. Um, so before I go to the questions from the audience, I would like to ask my own question about lipids, of course, you could imagine. So synaptic endosomes, you could basically characterize quite extensively that it's basically a lipid shell, right? So what, mm -hmm. what keeps the SMAPs together? So what kind of forces are keeping the SMAPs together? Yeah, well, I guess, so uh, again, we don't know. Uh, so our, our speculation would be that the core, uh, sorry, a uh, core of this map is probably uh, perhaps the circlycin granzyme B condensate. So this is kind of a negatively charged polymer with a positively charged protein. So there's electrostatic uh, forces be holding those together. But we know you need to keep the granzyme B concentration up in the high micromolar, like 40, 50 micromolar to basically drive this condensate formation. Uh, so the shell, I guess, uh, would have to be uh, containing that condensate in some way and keeping it from dispersing in the extracellular space. And, they, and, we, and, and these things are stable for like an hour. Now, thrombospondin one, that, um, go back up, where was this? Yeah. So, so this part of thrombospondin one is highly acidic and it's known to inhibit perforin uh, in its acidic, in this highly acidic low calcium kind of state. So it'll complex with perforin uh, and, and kind of, uh, but when calcium is present, so between 10 micromolar and 100 micromolar calcium, or maybe 300 micromolar calcium, you titrate these 20 sites and that changes the structure. It basically makes the, the structure much more compact 
and pulls it in around this lectin-like domain at the C-terminus. And this lectin-like domain is what binds CD47. So we think the, the storage form and then the extracellular form when you have calcium or not have calcium probably is different. But again, the input, how that really affects the triggering of these structures and like what those cells that we dropped on there had to do to trigger these, we don't know. But we suspect that there's some kind of a porous yet effective shell. And maybe, maybe it's some kind of electrostatic shield or something that keeps the granzyme and perforin from flying out uh, slowly or even you know, so it keeps it for 24 hours. Okay, so um, one of the questions from the audience from uh, Pieta Matila, very interesting. How much protein extracted from the SMAPs did you need for MS? How many cells were required? I think this is a question for Stefan or Roman. <laughs> okay, so if I can, I can answer that question. Uh, so SMAPs uh, from approximately three and a half million primary CTLs is enough. If you are using CD8 T cells, in this case, uh, you need to make sure that they all of them contain granzyme and perforin. Mm -hmm. So three to five million primary CTL is sufficient for mass spec analysis. More is better as all mass spec people will tell you. Okay, so one more question from me. Um, when you have, you know, all these protein components and antibodies can actually label it even without doing anything. Did you ever try to label with any kind of lipid molecules to see if there's anything inside? Yeah, I, Stefan can also address this. I think that would be. Uh, yeah, so we stain with a uh, general membrane dyn stains such as DII, DIO, uh, DID, and uh, none of them actually stains these vesicles, these particles, the SMAPs. So that was one of the big questions because if we did exosome staining, all these membrane dyes are actually staining them as well as uh, VGA. However, in this case, it's only VGA which stains them. And then we figure out that it actually, it's a, it binds glycoproteins. Mm -hmm. So that's how it, we looked for a pro, uh, from the list of proteomics and look what was uh, unique. So totally no chance for lipids. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> We're kind of yeah. interested in the idea that they would, uh, you know, so, so when people talk about cytotoxic exosomes, uh, you know, clearly from the work from Peters I showed earlier that you have this co coexistence of the core vesicles and the, uh, these condensates together. Uh, it, it may be that when these things are released together, like you see for uh, uh, FAS and uh, Yeah, this one here, you know, so you have basically close, close juxtaposition of, of fast ligand positive vesicles, uh, fast ligand here with the perforin positive particles uh, that they may form complexes that could work together. I mean, that would be one, one possibility for getting lipids involved. <laughs> Thanks for finding a way. Like, <laughs> well, it's fine, so always the, look for ways. So can we also call this particles let's say a liquid particle, or it's more like a gel particle? You know, I think we, we're not really sure. So I, I think right now, if you look at the old EMs, the, the, the central, the core parts of these things look very spherical, like perfectly in some EM preservations, like perfectly spherical. So I think that they, they look like they have some characteristics of like a condensate, like a droplet in that, in that context, but the, the shell, in both, you know, again, scanning through all DMs and, and what we see looks much more heterogeneous. So maybe much more of a solid type, yeah, gel like probably the, the shell may be a, more of a gel like structure than the, uh, than, mm -hmm. whereas the core may be more liquid. That would be interesting to measure. For sure. Yeah. Yeah. So, David Imos from Turkey, um, she's asking, how can spam composition change during viral infection or maybe general infection? Hmm. Do we have any idea? We'd love to know, actually. This is sort of, we're starting, obviously, it's very popular to think about ways to combat COVID-19 and uh, SARS-CoV-2. Uh, so we're, we're starting to think about whether 
did these does the innate specificity of these particles have any selectivity for an infected versus a non-infected cell, that kind of thing? Uh, and, and would, you know, things like exposure of the T cells to type one interferon or something like during a viral infection, would that change those composition of SNAPs? We really don't, we don't know at this point. Another question from Simon Davis. Nice work, Mike. Any indications how the other 80 or so proteins are concentrated in SNAPs? Yeah, so the, the chemokines, I guess, could be pulled in by a similar mechanism to the granzyme B, although the granzyme B gets to these compartments because it has mannose 6-phosphate, so it's, it's shunted towards that compartment. Uh, how, you know, things like the chemokines and the interferon, which again are a small number of proteins, but, but kind of interesting, uh, you know, whether they're going with the surglycin maybe, which is a pretty ubiquitous protein in general. If you look at its distribution, it's pretty much expressed everywhere. So, so whether like surglycin would be kind of a molecule that's sort of helping capture some of the other cargo. And then there are these other proteins in there. I don't know what Stefan thinks, but the, and Roman, but there's just a whole bunch of like kind of cytoplasm. I said cytoskeleton earlier by mistake, but like there's filament and there are other, other kind of clearly cytoskeletal proteins in there. And I, uh, ribosomal proteins, I don't know how they get in there. If that's autophagy or what? Do you have any ideas, Stefan? Well, to address this question, I, I look for some of the proteins what we actually had there uh, already, like thrombospondine 4, and that was what looked like a cluster on one side of the SMAPs. Uh, the same was for uh, the galactin behaved similarly to a thrombospondine, so formed, a, uh, formed basically a shell and i was not looking for the rest so that's something what we want to investigate more yeah. uh, in the future yeah one comment i guess is that the we saw the icam1 binding and yeah. and the other <clears throat> signal that you have in the particles is the only membrane protein basically is uh the, L, the alpha sabina of lfa1 uh but i guess i i think we i've discussed this with stefan and it doesn't seem like it stains, LFA1 antibodies don't stain the SNAPs. So we think that's probably little membrane fragments that are probably just inevitably gonna be left as we knock the cells off that have LFA1 in them. And the way that the SNAPs bind to ICAM1 is probably different, is probably not LFA1. Uh, because there, there doesn't, again, doesn't seem to be a membrane and LFA1 is definitely a membrane protein. So when you think about the other proteins, are they known to interact with each other? outside the SMAPs? Do you have such an interact on data, for instance? There was well, in the, okay, go ahead, Stefan. Yeah, so one what already Mike mentioned is, for example, thrombospondin is a binding partner for CD47. And that's actually expressed in a lot of, uh, basically in all, all cell types, most. So maybe that's one of the key. And most of these thrombospondins are having multiple different ligands. Uh, we are not sure what they exactly could bind in a specific situation, but uh, maybe it will be good to investigate if we will express some specific ligands on different cells and whether they could be killed just by that type of interaction. Okay, another question by Tess Stanley from York. Fantastic talk, more of a technical question. How does WGA bind specifically to dense granzyme granule and not any other vesicles in the cells? Yeah, I don't, I wouldn't make that claim. Sorry, sorry, if I made that, if I made, if I seem to be too, sim I oversimplified the argument there. Uh, I, it's, it's, I, I think Stefan could probably comment on this. I doubt this kind of, uh, you know, what I was suggesting about, okay, you, you, you pulse and then you chase and all of it ends up in the density. That's probably oversimplified. I mean, there probably is still a membrane, membrane signals all over the place. They're just relatively weaker. Yeah, so <clears throat> follow up to, to Mike's comment, actually. Yes, it's true. If you stay with VGA, it will also stay use the membranes outside. And that's one of our, uh, we have a multiple example of it in our supplemental figures. But what I want to point out here is that all our proteome, we can stay with VGA exosomes and SMAPs. But any uh, generally used membrane dyes, such as DII, DIO, DID, are only staining exosomes. We are not able to stain with them the SMAPs. And more importantly, from our protomics list, we don't have any type of tetraspanning, which is present in the list. 
which suggests that they are not uh, exosome based because most of the exosomes and the main characteristic of exosome is let's say the expression of CD9, CD63, CD81, which are uh, tetraspinals. Yeah, I mean, this, Thank you. That's Thank a good you. I mean, this, this kind of contrast, I mean, now the, 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 so this is that the result of that pulse chase labeling. So I have a feeling, I, I don't know, again, when Sedina was taking these images, what kind of thresholding needed to be done to get to that kind of contrast. But my guess is that you probably have a tenfold greater signal in the granules than in other membrane compartments. So practically speaking, you can separate them, but I don't think it's, a, I don't think it's absolute. So, sorry, go ahead. Thank you. Thanks, Mike and Stefan. So another question by Rakhavendra Palankar. Since TSP1 can bind to integrins through ECMs, is there a possibility that the SMAPs are engaged at the target cell through this link? And by the way, CTL granules look similar to alpha granules and platelets. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, so, so it's interesting, right? Because thrombospondin 1 in the platelets is 100. 40 kilodalton. So even though, you know, these, these, uh, so the, and in fact, the, the, the material we use as a control is from, is, is I think it's platelet derived. Uh, so, you know, uh, so, so they're, they're probably, you know, yeah, maybe there's a parallel pro process happening in other cells, but it seems like at least the processing of the thrombospondin is different between the T cells and, and what, what the mature form in the platelets. Uh, the integrin question, Definitely, and right, there's an RGD loop that's in those uh, type three repeats. And that, uh, you know, so, so the wheat germ, I mean, uh, so thrombospondin one is like a Swiss army knife for interactions. It's got all kinds of motifs for interacting in a large protein. And even just that C-terminal fragment has many potential interactions. So it would be interesting to mutate out that RGD, mutate the, the globe domain that contains the CD47 binding site, all of that, the, the details of how to do that's not quite clear, but you know, presumably doable. Uh, yeah, and to basically play around with this and see if one could change the function of these things in this way. But yeah, so I, I think we, there's, there's a lot, lot potentially to do with this. Mm -hmm. So I think the next question is definitely about more potential of this uh, findings. Matteo Morotti from Greece is saying, thank you. In what way these maps could be engineered for cancer immunotherapy? This is question number one. Yeah. And the second, would you expect any changes in SMAPs composition during T cell exhaustion? Hmm. Yeah, good question. Um, yeah, so so engineering, um, you know, I guess you know our initial thoughts are probably pretty naive and pretty straightforward, maybe fairly maybe obvious types of things like. Uh, if we believe thrombospondin one is controlling the specificity in significant part, we can basically, again, just like mutate the thrombospondin one, maybe use knock-ins in the cell lines to change, to you know, essentially eliminate some of its innate targeting and then replace it with, because we can say add things to the C terminus, it seems. Could we add single chain FVs? Could we add peptides that interact with surface molecules could we basically just target them and then, uh, yeah, you know, basically use them like uh, people use or envision using exosomes, like, you know, they could just be like a biologic. And, and I wonder, you know, because these things are proteinaceous uh, structures and, you know, to some extent, maybe self-assembling or kind of self-centering, like once you get them into the sweet spot, they may actually kind of, you know, have some kind of robustness. Uh, you know, maybe we could even like just freeze dry them and, you know, kind of distribute them in uh, like vials like you would some vaccines, rehydrate them, boom, they form, and then off you go. You know, so, so again, we, we have some initial things that we want to try out, but, you know, they're probably really kind of quite naive at this point, and we'll probably, presumably will be wrong initially, but I, I, th I think it's a definitely a worthwhile thing, because this is a way that the T cells are doing this. So I think I think trying to understand that and maybe emulate it and extend it is is a natural thing. Yeah, and about the T cell exhaustion. Ah, exhaustion. Um, yeah, I guess that that probably goes along the same lines as you know what happens during infection. Like if you modify T cell activation in either a way that essentially would in, potentially enhance effector function or suppress effector, effector function, would you actually change the composition of these particles? And is that a layer of regulation? 
like, you know, one thing could be maybe you change the proportion of the particles versus the soluble forms. That could be one possibility uh, without really even changing the particles. Or you could, you know, attenuate the particles in some way, like maybe by downregulating thrombospondin one, perhaps. Or, you know, so again, we, we, we don't have, but I think it would be, uh, you know, very interesting to start looking at transcriptomic data sets and things on relevant proteins, their, their expression patterns, and to see if we could just sort of like predict, okay, what's gonna happen with the SMAPs when, you know, like what happens with thrombospondin? There's, there's, you know, I remember when Stefan first came to me and told me that thrombospondin was part of these particles, I was looking in the, like the InGen data from mouse and saying, well, wait a second, there's no signal for this in T cells. And again, I think, you know, there may be some species specific aspects of this that we need to still understand even to be able to like model it. So, so I, think, I think there's some uh, fundamental stuff to learn, but I think now, nowadays it seems like, you know, hey, we can, we can start generating vaccines in a month. You know? So I think to go from just observing these particles in the past couple of years to engineering them you know, this year, you know, I think is not unreasonable. Hmm. Okay, I think this is, uh... This is all from the audience side as well. Thank you very much, Mike. It was fantastic talk. Stefan, thanks a lot for contributing, Roman. It's fantastic paper, fantastic um, presentation. Thanks a lot. Thanks for the opportunity. Really enjoyed Thank it. Thank you. Enjoyed the questions. Thanks.